Sure, Epstein. Here. Schroeder. Schroeder, are you here? Walked away from his. Well, I can see his chair. Why don't we come back to him? Okay. Uh, Midrotanda. Here. Perot. Hi. Present. Dornbrook, Dornbrook here, and uh, is Schroeder here yet? Well, he's he's on Zoom, but he's physically not on in his chair. Okay. All right. Okay. All, so we we have a, a quorum at least. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, Eric, do you have any announcements? Uh, just the same announcement we've had for the last, well, few years. Um, please use the raise your hand function with Zoom webinars. That's the only way we'll be able to uh, allow you to speak or see that you wish to speak. Um, and all votes will be taken by a roll call. Okay, and the other thing I would mention is the um, <clears throat> The C3 meeting starts at four o'clock. So my plan for, for the budget for this meeting is two hours and I'll move things along if, if, they, if they get bogged down, but that's, that's the intention. Uh, are there any corrections to the agenda or the consent calendar? Okay, I'm not seeing any or hearing any. They'll leave them as there are. Uh, are there any comments from the audience? An opportunity for members of the public to address the board on a topic that's not in the agenda. Uh, we have Sandy that would like if to you, Yeah, so raise, raise your hand if you're in that. And Eric, I'll let you call on people. Yep, Sandy Goldberg's up first. And she's unmuted and ready to go. Hi, everybody. Okay. Hi, Hi Sandy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I'd just like to bring to the attention of the PUD board that there is a grant open. It's called the State Fire Assistant Grant through the California Fire Safe Council. The, um, the grant is a, actually it will cover three different areas of fire prevention, but the one that I would really encourage um, PUD to look at would be, it's called fuel mitigation treatments. And under that, what it says is fuel hazard mitigation vegetation treatments such as chipping, thinning, burning, grazing. So our thought from the fire wise committee is that PUD could apply for this grant and we're happy to help write it and um, take the charge on it, but it could help cover the expenses that you incur by getting bringing in the green waste bins and doing a chipping program. Um, the grants is, is, is complicated. They do need procedures, protocols, policies, things like that, that I know you already have in place. Um, deadline is April 14th. So it, it's, you know, it, I think the minimum is two thousand um, dollars beth might might know the exact amount but it can go up all the way up i think to 20 or thirty thousand dollars so it'd be something to to look at um, like i said the deadline is april 14th i i thought uh, that's it thank you i i took a look at that grant and i thought the average grant was like one hundred and eleven thousand. Did did i read that wrong i think it's a little bit bigger Potential. Oh, it could you. It could be. Yeah, they're, and, they're, and it has to yeah, be. They're funding up to one point one seven five million. Yeah, I heard when they've done the grants in the past, they were up to one hundred eleven thousand, and the grant money has to be used in twenty four months. Um, so you could, I think, you can apply it to labor as well as small capital equipment. They don't want you to try to buy a, a you know large fire truck or something like that. It mentions things like chainsaws. It might go to the extent of the expense of a chipper or something like that, is what I think I read. Okay. You well, know, uh, it, Sandy, thank you, you, thank have, you for bringing it to our attention. There was another grant yeah. in January. Yes, there was another grant in January. That sounds more like what you're talking about, John. But anyway, yes, please, let's take a look at this because it's okay. potential money that could help PUD and the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I see Beth McAllister has her hand raised also. 
Oh, hi. I just wanted to add that it is a 50-50 matching grant. So it really would apply to something that um, is already a planned expense and we could get, or you know, the PUD could get half of it back through this grant. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, written comments from the public would be in the board packet. Uh, Eric, I don't believe we had any this time. I don't believe so, no. Yeah, okay. So I, why don't we move? I yeah. thought there was a letter from uh, uh, a fellow from East Meadow that was sent to the board members. Shana, something like that? Uh, yeah, that's not in the board packet, but you received my response in, via email through Jess. I, I thought whenever an email was sent to at least three board members, that would be part of the packet. Uh, okay. I will look into that. That what Eric that what was Eric Rickel was saying when he was president. Okay. And I, and I think the value of that is to be open and transparent. Mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. I, I will look into it. It's obviously not in this packet. Uh, adoption of the consent calendar then, is there a motion to adopt it? Yeah, Dornbrook so moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, roll call, Peter, please. Sure. Epstein? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Intertanda? Aye. Perot? Aye. Dornbrook, aye. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're ready to move on to item 9A, the meetings, page 24. Eric? Actually, I'll let Jess, since this is a uh... Since she prepared, I'll let her take care, take the lead. Okay, Jess. All right. So um, it's all pretty laid out. Hang on, I'm bringing up the staff report. It's all pretty laid out in the staff report. I can't. I can't find it. <laughs> um, but basically, it's on the screen, Jess. Okay. Oh, my screen's all covered with everything. Basically, <laughs> uh, it looks like the state of emergency that has been declared by Governor Newsom is going to end on March 31st. And if that's the case, and the, the state of emergency doesn't get renewed, then we're required to go back to meet under the rules prior to the COVID pandemic and AB 361. So <laughs> uh, it's all kind of hinging on whether Newsom renews that state of emergency. My gut instinct is that he's not going to based on what's happening in the rest of the state. Um, local health orders in Alpine County have been relaxed. Um, the, all the county uh, offices are open. They're all, they're all working and letting the public in. So I think that uh, a staff recommendation is to let's go back to normal. <laughs> let's go back to meeting how we used to, or at least under a hybrid model where, you know, some folks could physically be in the boardroom and some folks could be Zooming as long as there is a quorum in the service area. Okay, so that would take effect at our April 8th. Yes, that would take effect at the April next meeting. 8th meeting. And then of course, if All Gavin right. Newsom does extend the state of emergency, we could continue meeting under what, like how we're doing right now, um, you guys would just have to ratify the resolution at the beginning of that April 8th meeting. Okay, and why don't you just clarify if a board member can't attend in person, but is attending remotely, then where their location needs to be publicly available? Yes. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Yes, okay. so we'd have, we would have to notice that location. That location would have to be open to the public uh, so that the public could come in and participate in the meeting at that remote location. Uh, okay, so right after March 31st, maybe board members could let Jess know if they're not attending in person 
and the location they would be at that would need to be published so the public could also attend. Yeah, then I could prepare the notice that you would have to okay. post on the door of wherever you're right. going to be. Okay. Are there any questions for Jess? Well, I'm not question. I want to comment. Uh, I agree with Jesse on the fact that it's unlikely this is, the emergency is going to be extended, but we'll see. Uh, I think having the meeting in the middle of the week is actually becoming a serious hindrance here. Um, having to open your house to anyone that wants to attend is, especially since COVID is not gone, uh, 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 no. And as this aside, I'm concerned, it's not something I'm, I can contemplate. But bottom line is, I think uh, and that's one of the reasons I wanted, I was objecting to this move to the middle of the week for the meeting. So I think this is a problem. Okay, are there any other comments? By the middle of the week, you mean Friday at two? Well, today is Thursday, by the way. Well, that was an exception, yes. Well, sorry, Bertrand. Uh, I want to understand your objection. Is it because of the 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 need of quorum in Kirkwood, or the the fact that we would that if you if we don't attend in person, you'd have to have you need to open some, your house to the public, yes. But what, I guess I'm, I just want to make sure I understand what well, what does I'm, the day what does the day of week have to do with that if you don't attend? I guess. No, it's easier to be in the weekend. Uh, for, that's why we had board member the meeting on Saturdays. It's because it's easier for the public and the board members to attend if you have to be should, there physically. I, I would just note that okay. our attendance during weekdays has been higher than it has on weekends. So that's 100, 180 degrees from what was just stated. Well, can I, I'd like you to provide us number on number of, uh, not just on a one or two uh, instance, please. Uh, don't do statistic on insufficient number. So for the purpose of this discussion, we're just discussing how the April 8th meeting will be continued. Be happy to, at a later date, analyze uh, attendance and, and see how we're doing. I, I guess my question is, there is no discussion on, like there is no, conversation about how to operate on April 8th if the extension is not made. The, the, that That's is not that, that there's no conversation about that. That's the correct. conversation is the only open question is when in a time frame on a day of week or time of day do we hold our board meetings in accordance with that? Is that am I understanding that? That's correct. Okay. Okay. I uh, just this is an informational or is there any action the board needs to take? Well, um, I think you guys should decide whether or not you're going to go back to what kind of a meeting you want to hold. Do you want to hold a hybrid meeting? Do you want to hold a fully in-person meeting? Um, do you want to open the office? Um, so I think that uh, those decisions need to be made. Well, I'm talking about the office, actually, that's a very good point to bring in. Uh, everywhere it's open, so it's about time that you the, the community service building open to the public as well. Uh, we may still have a mask requirement for unvaccinated people if that makes people more comfortable, but I think uh, that needs to be changed. And when we, once we do that, I think we need to remove the, the, the dialogue that pop up at every click on the website saying that we are closed. So right now the local health orders state that Mass, the mask mandate has been lifted mm -hmm. um, so people can wear it if they want. They don't have to. It's not mandatory. Um, the local uh, Alpine County offices are open and they are they're following Dr. Johnson's uh, advice and saying that uh, masks are recommended but not mandatory. Well, I guess... What? Go ahead. I was like, Bertrand, I mean, in terms of your open, your, I, I agree with what you stated earlier in the sense of, you know, opening home wherever you are and if you decide not to, to attend in person and everything. So, I mean, going back to the question that Jess is asking about how do we operate in the future, I would hope that we would consider 
having hybrid meetings, at least for the very near term future, if not for the longer term future, in the sense that you know many families uh, have children or grandchildren who are not able to be vaccinated and may not want to be going into rooms with many people and then that who may or may not be vaccinated or masked at the same time. So I would ask that the board consider, at con least consider going forward with the hybrid option, if not for the long term, but for very much so the very short term. Well, the, hy the hybrid model just means that we're going to always offer Zoom so members of the public Correct. can attend. The law states that if a board member is not attending in the office, then they're only considered attending in a public location, which yeah. means when the Understood. public can attend. That's that's the law. Yeah, and I understood, I, but they can, I, but yeah, I can I attend in a public that. place. Someone can attend in a public place that's not in an office, in an enclosed yeah, no, office I've, that is locked into a bunch yeah. of people with no masks on. You can attend a meeting in a public place right. that is outside. That Yes, that's absolutely true. It's just, it has to be at a location that's published where the public can attend. I ha understood. I did one in a hotel in Canada. Understood. I did one in my home, yeah. Understood. Anyway, my point is, is that uh, that, that, as long as that is still an option for especially board members, but I think certainly for our general public, we would want to have hybrids available and not yes. only not only have them have to be there in person to attend as well. Right. The, the, we the hybrid meetings is that technical issues. Uh, the sound system didn't work very well in the one hybrid meeting that we did. And I don't know, is Drew going to be back in March? I mean, in I April? Don't, I don't believe so. Uh, th that, that's the problem with the hybrid. I mean, we had some technical issues. It wasn't, the sound system wasn't very adequate. Uh, and historically, we've had, you have to, op technically you have to open your home to the public, but how often has, has the public actually entered anybody's home? I would say very seldom. Realist, being realistic. Once that I know of. <laughs> Once, uh, yeah. Yeah, it happened to me. Okay. It was fine. So, <laughs> that's why. That Jack Longinati, Bob? Well, yeah, it was, it was, it worked, it was just fine. I, I'd, I'd be an advocate for just going back to the full on open meetings. And if somebody can't make it, as long as we have a quorum, they can zoom in. That, that is the hybrid model that we always, the meetings always on Zoom and the board is in person. Is there any other discussion on this topic? Well, we need to discuss, we move on? Of, we need to discuss about um, the building being open as well. Obviously, if you are doing public meetings, then it has to be open. Yeah, if yeah. you read Jess's recommendation, it, it outlines what we're asking for, which is that the board say, yes, we open the CSB. Yes, we stick with hybrid. Um, so, yeah. So, okay. So, so, rather, so I would motion to accept the staff's recommendations uh, in that regard then. Okay. Bob, if we need to have a vote. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Uh, okay. So we'll just do a roll call supporting the staff's recommendation. Oh, hold on. Uh, so staff recommendation is actually uh, taking only act uh, effect on March 31st, or is that going to be earlier? Uh, it would take effect on April 1st. Yeah, after this expires. We would probably open the office tomorrow, quite frankly. Okay. That's what I would prefer, yes, thank you. Yeah, and then I'll get rid of that message on the website. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks for that clarification. Okay, Peter, roll call. Epstein. Aye. Schroeder. Aye. Midorotanda? Aye. Perot? Aye. Dornbrook, aye. Okay, uh, thank you all. So let's move on now to item 9B, the finances. Kelly? And um, I assume, Bob, you want me to go through just like we did last? Uh, yes, everyone has reviewed them. So if they three. have specific questions, I'll bring them up. And uh, I do have one thing that I would like to point out that was a change from uh, last month's um, uh, financials. If you uh, go to the electric fund on page 35 of your packet, um, you'll notice 
that in other non-operating revenues, there is a total in there of $512,000. 450 of that was um, property tax revenue that was needed to be allocated to the electric fund for calendar year 21 so that we would meet our tier ratios for calendar year 21. So that's really the only big thing, the only big change that I wanted to point out because that was a change from last month's um, financials. Um, so Kelly, I do have a question about the, um, how you've broken out the base rates. Sure. Um, the, so this revenue on page 35 shows commercial base rates of 178,000. Mm -hmm. But when you go to, pay, and well, resident and residential of 79, but when you go to page 41, which is February's base rates. Page 41. They're substantially different. February, that's the total. That's not just electric. If you're looking oh, at February right. okay. preliminaries, yeah. I, I, knew, I knew there was something I was missing. Okay, yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> okay. But yes, and that was the other change that was made um, per the request of Bertrand that uh, base rates be broken out into a separate line on the financials, which I do. Yeah. I thank you very much for that. It's going to be very useful to try to analyze the impact on the new electrical rate. The one thing where it is difficult now is that we have it on the current, uh, on this form, but if you want to try to compare to a year ago, then we don't have it. So I just don't know how we can solve that so we can actually make meaningful oh, assessment. Yes, okay. Yeah, Bertrand, we have a we have a proposed solution on the performance reporting. And if you and if you would like a copy of an old, uh, you know, old financials with them broken out, I'm happy to send uh, you them. That'd be great. So I will do that. So when I'm starting to look at it, the other comment I would say, yeah, I didn't had a chance because of the timing. Uh, both middle of the week for Thursday for the meeting and the uh, packet for the board being available so late that I could not do my what I would call my due diligence on this packet and I, I really uh, think we need to space out a bit more so we can have time to look at the data. Um, yeah and so uh, I want, I will actually make a request at some point to for specific data so I can make comparison year over year. Yeah, thank you. Sure. But it's actually very uh, interesting already to see uh, how this is panning out actually. And, and I cannot make conclusion at this meeting because I didn't get the data soon enough, early enough. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, are there other things you want to point out about the financials? Uh, not about um, the January financials. No, that's okay, are there, unless there are, are any there other questions. Are there questions from the board about January? Okay. Let's move okay. on. Sure. Uh, moving on then to the February preliminary. Um, so operating revenues for the month of February. Uh, we're down from plan by just about $6,000. Uh, year to date, we are down from plan by $48,000. And again, this is a combined uh, preliminary. So this is all of the funds. Any questions on February preliminary? Um. I'm not sure at which part of the packet is that, but the, the, I don't know if it's in the claim that has already been approved for, but I have a question. So there was a, a, a water heater replacement, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is that for Lavarock, I'm assuming? Yes. Yes. It's, can you be a bit more specific on, I mean, is it, uh, 50 gallon or 80 gallon? It's just a replacement tankless. unit? It's huh? a tankless water it's a heater. Tankless water heater. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. And it was just for one of the units whose water heater has failed. Or extraordinarily uh, expensive. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of flabbergasted when I saw that number. 
And yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and I mean, using the same uh, supplier, I've been very surprised lately of uh, one simple uh, uh, fix on a plumbing system that was also extremely expensive. So I was just was curious about, is that uh, Rinai or is that a different brand, do you know? I, I don't know, but what I can tell you is we did have a project in a few years ago that staff recommended to core. Right now there's no venting. And so we have to use these very spe specialized water heaters okay. um, and dryers and wash, well, not the washing machines, but the dryers and the water heaters are very special and they're very expensive. Um, if we did the coring project, it would have cost us at the time about $20,000. Um, and we could have used regular water heaters and regular uh, dryers. Unfortunately, yeah, the project I, I, was canceled. So um, it's we're going to continue to see those. And it's only going to go up from there because we have a few more to fail for sure because they're very well, old. Yeah. And uh, yeah, condensation system are actually very uh, prone to failure. So uh, maybe uh, the wool concept should be looked at to see if we could convert to something that is more manageable. Basically, not, with, not without uh, retrofitting the building, like I said, we'd have to core the building yeah. and vent. Yeah. Well, if it's sort of seven k pop, uh, you may want to look at uh, at the coring. The ROI is very fast because it's twenty grand versus yep. seven grand a pop. Yep, agreed. Yep. Agreed. So I, I would recommend staff to look into it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Was the comment I had for the February thing? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Any Peter, other? Peter, do you want? To, Peter, do you want to add that to the operations committee? Sure. Okay. It would, be under, it would just be back under capital projects. The same thing staff recommended before. We would update pricing. I'll just bring it back on the capital projects list. Which okay. Is, you rather do that? That's fine. That's how we did it last time. Um, okay. You know, and provided good. it gets passed through the budget this time, then we would be able to do it. Okay. Good. Anything okay. else on the budget? You want to move on to cash flow then? Sure. Okay. Uh, so total operating cash for the month of February ended at 2.8 million. Um, you can see now that all of our um, uh, cash flow has come back into uh, uh, come back into line uh, since uh, our biggest customer is no longer past due. So um, you can see how that really does affect our cash flow, but. We're back on track and um, yeah, it looks much better. It does. Any questions on cash flow? Okay, moving on to budget variances. Uh, the only thing that was updated here was the cost of purchase power through January of 22. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's move on to item 9C then, uh, credit card convenience charges. Eric, do you want to take this or? Sure. Wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this we've been kicking this can down the road for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so uh, we talked about this quite some time ago. It was um, given over to finance and then um, with everything else going crazy and Caldor and whatnot, it just fell off the, fell off the charts. But now, ostensibly, the district is, you know, losing tens of thousands of dollars every year uh, in credit card fees. We do. We did put a hundred dollar cap on um, a few years ago, which has helped a bit. But as you can see from the numbers in there, we're still um, losing tens of thousands of dollars. Now, we did um, look at a few alternatives of what we could do, um, continue with the status quo, lower the threshold or to pass all fees on. Um, in two different ways. And the finance committee and staff felt that the convenience charge was the simplest way to implement this. And it's very common throughout the utility industry in California. And so staff and the finance committee recommend um, the board adopt alternative 3B, which is to add a 3.5% convenience charge to all credit card transactions. And that we would not have this take place till after we send out a news, do a newsletter article and a notice to all credit card customers. I have a question. Uh, Do you think this would have a negative impact on delinquencies? 
No, we actually looked at that when we first did this way back when. Um, there was no uh, correlation between credit card and delinquencies. Quite frankly, it was um, a lot of I mean, people with very substantive bills paying with credit cards earning those miles, I think. Um, I mean, you know, $3,000 a month utility bills sort of sort of things. Because our shutoffs are a lot less than they used to be. A lot of that has to do with ACH, I think, as well. Okay. You know, most of our stuff comes through ACH, but no, we, there's no cor there was no demonstrable correlation between credit okay. and, and I actually do collections in the past, Pete, but you know, nobody was actually calling customers to say, hey, your past due 60 days, we're going to turn you off. So I'm sorry, I'm going to take credit for that one <laughs> or not. Thank you, Kelly. Having as many shutoffs because I actually do contact customers when they are past due. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, John, so, what? John, any comments from finance committee? Uh, I've actually been surprised over the last 12 years that I could pay by credit card and not have a fee. So I think this is, you know, a standard course of business and I don't see why we'd absorb that expense. So I think this is the right direction to go. And I'd be surprised if any of our customers would find it unusual because that's the way, um, you know, most of these charges happen. So I, I, we completely endorse it. Now, I'll okay. just add on though, is that I, I do think that this would be a good time to coincide uh, this change with an effort to get more customers on an automatic uh, payment plan for ACH and making sure that uh, people who have paid via ACH, we can even fill out most of the form for them because we'll have information and have them just sign the documents, add that to communications, add that to the newsletter because, I mean, Kelly just went over a few seconds ago, our largest customer affects cash flow if they're not signed up for ACH, uh, for example. And so I would like to see us move as much as we can to automatic payments and, and do other efforts around this, not just this change, but maybe this is a good motivating function to uh, engage in that way as well. Sandy has her hand up, Bob. Uh, okay, uh, Sandy, just unmute. Yeah, hi. Yeah. So I completely agree with the direction this is going. Um, we've been ACH for years and I really didn't know you could pay by credit card. And I'm frankly a little upset that you know, <laughs> many other people have and been getting their miles um, on the back of the KMPD and the public utility. I mean, it's just, it's just neat. This needs to change in my opinion. People will, people will either pay it or they'll switch to ACH, so. Thank you for taking us on. Thank you. So uh, my comment is I agree that need to be changed. Um, uh, as, and, and yes, this is getting in line with what most utilities, I, I can say all because we, we never sure, but uh, I would assume most, if not all utilities are doing my only concern is, and I agree that uh, it's totally inadequate for the PUD to spend tens of thousands of dollars to, 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 to pay for this. My only concern is it's for the few people that are at a low income hand, it's another hurdle for some of them. And I, I wonder if we could have looked at Instead of, I mean, hundred dollars of, of credit card fee is a substantial uh, amount. As I wonder if 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 something like much lower uh, could have been looked at as at least intermediate, just to ease for the people who don't have the means. You know? So, uh, but they still yeah. have to pay their credit card bill at the end. It's not, they still have to pay. That's right? correct, but that gives them time and everything. So I'm just saying that we are just, I agree with the concept 100%. I just wish we could have a little something that would make it easier for the people uh, in the low, in, low, low end of the income range. Yeah, so. Yeah, and I think Doug- We don't charge Doug, for Doug. ACH that that's, they can just get on ACH. We don't charge them to, to deduct directly from their bank account. Yes, that's assuming they have money in their bank account. Yeah. Well, it does wait to the very last possible day to, to pull it out. So, yeah. 
And the, and the other thing I would say, and, you, and you're fully aware of this, is that, and it's in Doug's report, um, the public benefit charge, if depending on how the customer survey comes out, there will be, there could be questions about would people take advantage of a low income program? And if so, then we can decide if we want, well, if we decide yes, then we have to hire a consultant to do a needs assessment and then we could actually set up a low income program. So that's in the works. That we would, yeah, I mean, as I said, we don't have that now. So I just wonder by having something intermediate that would be until we have a low income program, we don't now, uh, that to, to basically to smooth the transition for the people at the low hand. And people at the low hand, let's say they have a 500 bucks bill, uh, the 3.5% of that is, is not that high. So I, I would put something much lower on the credit card fee as a temporary solution until we have a low income program, just to make it easy for the people that struggle. It, I mean, this all surmises that the people using credit cards are low income and there's no evidence to support that. that I, I, don't ha I don't have the data, so I cannot argue that. Hmm. Okay, so... It, it's still uh, offer people who are on a bind at the end of the month to put it on a credit card uh, for, until they have some cash uh, coming in. It, it's just going to make an option less for people who struggle. That's basically what I'm saying. And I wish we could do, because currently at 100 bucks, uh, this is, to, we are talking about a 3,500 bucks uh, bill, uh, which is a, a pretty high bill for most residential, low income residential people. So it's not, it's not typical. So what I'm saying is, I would advocate to uh, at, at the as a transition maybe uh, until we get a low income program that we have uh, basically an option, uh, basically reduce this threshold of $100 or fees to something like, uh, if I take 500, it'd be about uh, 20 bucks or 15 bucks. I don't know what it is exactly, yeah. That would be my, my recommendation. But I agree with the principle, and I think that's where you need to be to, to be at the end of the game. But I think it's a bit abrupt here, and we are removing an option for the people who struggle to pay their utility bill. So there's some, so there's a recommendation that we approve a 3.5% convenience charge to be implemented after notifying the customers and giving them an opportunity to change to ACH or some other form of payment. Um, so it, does someone wanna make that motion or yeah, we, friend, do you wanna propose a different motion that we would vote on first? Well, we, we reviewed this in finance committee and it seems like it's you know simpler and less overhead to just do the recommendation to go with the convenience fee. And uh, I guess I'd, I'd make the motion to go with the recommendation, that recommendation. Okay, is there a second? Uh, I mean, I'll second it. I think without having data to support an alternative, I, it's hard for me to understand the implications. So I think uh, indications that I would say are to move forward with this, so I'll second it. Uh, okay. Uh, further discussion then? Okay, uh, not hearing any. Um, Peter, a roll call. Epstein? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Midratanda? Aye. Perot? Abstain. Uh, for the reason that I think we need to have a transition system, but uh, and I'm agree with the, the, the direction that this is going. Uh, Dorbrook, I. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Uh, next item, uh, 9D is performance reporting. And I think I saw Brandy. Hi, you right? did. I did. Okay, good. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Um, so we have performance reporting here. Um, and if we start with electric, uh, you can see that our February numbers for production or purchases off the grid are 827,000 kilowatt hours. Um, of those, we had a 5% um, unidentified loss and our year to date is 15% for electric. Any idea why that percentage loss went down sort of drastically? We were able to get all of the reads last month, including backside reads. Um, so oh. I think that, that affected that, as well as the timing of the meter reads. Because I mean, that's good. It's a good thing. But it is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, in propane, we had a usage of uh, 2.5 million cubic feet and we saw a negative 4% loss. So we're still in the negative territory um, year to date, negative 3%, um, but approximately where we expect to be. We bounce around between positive and negative 2%. I have a question on that. So if we end up to keep having negative number like that and finish with a negative number, it means basically we overcharge the customer. So are we going to do anything about that? Uh, year over year, these numbers uh, typically are positive and negative. I could go back and give you annual data, um, but it is not a consistent negative. And it has to do with the fact that our propane trucks fill up at a lower altitude where it's warmer typically, and they come up here. Um, so no, I would not recommend that we give customers back any money because this is something that corrects itself in the long run. Uh, okay, back to your concept here of loading at lower altitude. Um, so we are measuring what goes in the tank, not what they put in the truck, correct? Correct, but- So like why, why would that impact the thing? Um, because they, they load a liquid product um, and they deliver both a liquid and a gas product to our tanks um, because propane boils at such a low temperature that it's not a stable temperature. So you can't, you, you have to measure a, we measure at the meter in gas cubic feet. Um, we get deliveries in liquid gallons um, that are converted using a conversion um, equation to, to gas. So there is some room for discrepancy when you change altitude, which changes the pressure and when you deal with temperature differential. I understand that, but I don't see why this is impacting this number since you actually measure what you put in the tank, not what you put in the truck. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Bertrand. What we're billed on from the, the trucking company is what they're loaded with at the scales, so down below. Ooh, that, okay. So, so then that makes sense. Indeed. I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> so they are not measuring what they deliver to us? No, we, we measure, um, end of month tank values based on what is delivered into our tanks, but our um, deliveries are, uh, they're measured down at the way station. So should we actually do this uh, usage based not on this loading of the tank, but loading of the, of, I'm sorry, loading of the tank, not loading of the truck. Would that help your number if you do that? I think so. We don't have a gauge that measures the delivery into the tank. Oh, um, all we have is all we have is a, a level gauge on each of the tanks. No, I understand that. It would not be very accurate anyway. So no, I, I, I would assume that any propane tank, oh, propane truck, sorry that deliver has actually a meter that tell you how much it deliver. And this is what happened for uh, residential customers that get their own uh, deliveries. But so you are saying that there are not, no measure at the time of the, lo of the loading of the tank load. They don't give you a number. Correct, that, that's not what our bill is on. 
that's very surprising. I wonder if it'd be worth actually, I'm sure they have the, the, the capability since they do it for, for regular, uh, maybe, maybe because of bigger tank, I don't know. I I wonder, what problem are we trying to solve for here? I, I'm trying to well, understand I, I, what, I, I, what the I, problem is, because this is just performance reporting that our meters are at each individual house. Those are calibrated. So what is delivered to a home is correct. It's this discrepancy that we're taking what's delivered versus total sold that we're seeing, but it doesn't impact what's actually being delivered to home. So I'm trying to figure out what problem we're trying to solve and if we should be spending a lot of time on this. Okay. I'm, uh, what I'm trying to understand is why we have these numbers. And uh, it looks to me effectively, and uh, I understand now Brandy's explanation that the fact that they load at the lower altitude could have a factor uh, since we are trying to record performance on system and, and we have actually goals that have been assigned fairly arbitrary actually. And currently we're at minus 3%, uh, we'll see where we are at the end of the year. But uh, I, I just think that maybe having a, a better way of handling this uh, perform, uh, we call it the performance, no, how do you call it? Uh, performance reporting. Performance me, yeah, it would be actually uh, helpful, yes. So in the interest of time, since we do have a deadline at the end here, historically for, for many years, by the end of the year, the propane ends up pretty close to zero every year. So we haven't spent much time on it. Our main concern is whether there's leaks, if there's a, a significant number. And if yeah, I could add, Bob, it's, it's, we have looked at yeah. other methods of measuring uh, tank levels and master metering the system so that these ugly looking negative numbers don't show up anymore. But it, it was twenty or thirty thousand dollars per tank to get a different measuring system. And it just didn't seem that we were really gaining much because, like Bob right. said, we, we generally end up at zero. Well, that's a, that's a, OK, my whole premise is if we are getting negative and okay if it's hand up at zero it, it's a mute point but uh, uh, we have been consistently low this year and i just was wondering uh, if uh, we should try to do a better job uh, because i mean leaks smell and uh, before they explode but uh, yes having a more a, a more accurate measurement of what we have in our take has value in my opinion Okay, I'm going to ask Brandy to keep moving on in the interest sure. of time. Sure thing. Um, water uh, for the month of February, we had a production of the well from the wells of 1.8 million gallons. Uh, our unidentified system losses were at 10%, uh, and we're at 11% for the year on water. Um, and then lastly, February wastewater at the plant, uh, our influent meter uh, measured 2.3 million gallons. Of that, 29% was um, non sewer water or INI. Um, so it we're at 26% for the year. So we had some warm weather. Um, and we generally, this time of year, start to see an uptick in INI. Um, any questions on the numbers for each department before I move on to our graphs? Okay. Um, so on the graphs this month, we have the same aquifer level average um, and min and max that you've seen in previous months. Um, so that's updated through March for the water system. And then what's new this month is um, we have historical uh, use for each of the departments by month broken down um, residential versus versus commercial, excuse me. Um, and it's overlaid with a, a temperature average per month. Um, so if you take a look, you can see the correlation between cold temperatures uh, in the winter months, higher electric usage, uh, water usage and propane usage. Uh, Eric, do I, can you, are you going to advance the slide? Oh, thank you. And uh, Bob, I don't know if there was anything you wanted to add on that, but I do not have anything else for performance reporting. 
I will, uh, if we can back up for a second to electric. Um, Bertrand asked the question last time, you know, why the drop is, was the drop off in commercial or residential and how do you tell? You used to be able to tell by total dollars, but since that's now different, looking at it by kilowatt hours uh, lets you see it. So if you look at December, for example, you can see that the residential, which is the red tip, is about the same uh, in, in this fiscal year as in the last fiscal year, but there's a significant drop in commercial, and that's due to the fact that there was very little uh, snowmaking activity in December in the most recent year versus the prior year. So the blue bars give you an idea of how commercial is performing in each month. The red bars let you know how residential is doing. And then the, um, the wavy lines there let you try to imply whether there's a correlation with temperature, which on electric isn't too obvious, <laughs> isn't too obvious since we don't have much electric usage that varies by temperature. Uh, if you move on to the next chart on propane, uh, then there there is there is quite a bit uh, of difference. There's some serious changes in average temperature. Uh, like if you look at 2020 in October, right? You can you can see that the average temperature was quite a bit higher at 50 degrees than what it was for the other two years, and you can see the the propane uh, for that one year is lower. So you can since propane is primarily Heating, not cooking, uh, you, you can see more correlation there. Uh, so, Bersanda, this is a follow-up to your suggestion of having a, a visual way to try to get a better sense of what's happening in commercial and residential. And I think this is meaningful than dollars since since the change in how the how the rates are calculated. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I would have to uh, take a little time to understand, uh, look at this data. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's important that we track both. And I think since we have changed the right structure, it really make it more important. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for the suggestions. This mm -hmm. makes it much visually much easier to see what's going on in terms of kilowatt hours sold or propane, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cubic feet sold and then water uh, you can see the water what we're showing here is only uh, residential usage we don't it currently doesn't include irrigation I'm not sure if that should be separate or or combined but it doesn't it doesn't include irrigation whereas brandy's reporting does include the irrigation water as well as the domestic this is just domestic water and this is in cubic feet whereas the other report is in gallons so. Yeah, and you can see the evacuation uh, impact on the water <laughs> September. Boy, I'll say. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah. yeah, in September, we have much less residential water consumption due to evacuation. Yeah, and if, you, if mm -hmm. this had included irrigation, then it wouldn't have been as obvious because the irrigation would also include things like um, the, the hydrant meters, the hydrants, mm -hmm. and the uh, use for, for water. Uh, the other thing we thought about adding is also uh, a line that would show um, residency. Because residency and temperature mm -hmm. are the two big variables for these things. So thank you for the suggestion. Can I ask just a quick clarifying question? All, all these charts, I see four labels of years for each color, yes. but I yeah. only see three bars. Right. So it's because, what year yeah. am I looking at in each of those months? Well, so that's why there's the labels down there. They're in the same order as the bars. And the issue is this is showing, uh, it's easier to look at a calendar January to December, but obviously we haven't finished uh, this fiscal year. So the only time there'd be three bars in every category is at the end of a fiscal year. Yeah. And, so, uh, when we, so, so if you line these 19, 20, and 21, and some other months it's 20, 20, 20 21, 20, 22. Yeah, because these are showing you by. So you're only by ever going to show year. me three bars. You're never going to show me four. Uh, right. Okay. That's right. And then the two means we haven't finished the fiscal year. Gotcha. Yeah. And there's actually room we played with showing more than three years.
Uh, thanks, Brandy. Are there any other questions for Brandy? Okay, then let's move on to item 9E, Alpine County LAFCO representation. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I have one more question um, on these I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, please, uh, go ahead. Uh, so the IRI, no, I suppose this is irrigation for snowmaking, it, it, so that's not part of what we were looking at, correct? This doesn't include any sales of irrigation or construction water. And snowmaking for the resort? Uh, Eric, that, Tim, Timber Creek. That's uh, is Timber. I think Timber Creek would. No, Brandy. Construction water. It's, it's, commercial. Construction. it's also construction water. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, okay. That's, that's right. It looks like that. I wanted to double check. Thank you. No, yeah. Timber yeah. Yeah. Creek, yeah. Timber Creek's the only one that takes off of our potable system, and it is a. It's treated as a construction area. That's one of the things we need to bring right. back to finance. Is how to deal with that. We've been talking about it, and um, okay. So that is something on finances agenda. Right. But in terms of the chart, it would not appear because Correct. it's not a domestic use. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, LAFCO? Uh, so uh, LAFCO finally met after, <laughs> I wish Terry was on, but she had a conflict today. Um, but she does love our Friday meetings better. Um, but uh, <laughs> They met for the first time since 2011. If that gives you an idea wow. how long it's been since they've met. Um, but uh, they finally did meet um, and they did vote um, four to one with Red Lake Ron being the only one voting against it um, to accept special districts. Um, as uh, on to LAFCO, there is some discussion about how they're going to do it, if they're going to reduce two existing seats or add two seats. Um, CSDA's council believes adding is uh, appropriate. Um, that way there's no uh, detriment to the existing LAFCO. Um, county council believes they have to delete. So the two attorneys were gonna talk to each other and bring that back. But um, uh, Tiola, who is the executive officer for LAFCO and also the uh, county clerk has 15 days. Um, from March 1st, so next week, uh, to get us to pull the districts on voting. We can do it by email um, and our nominations, which is great. So we don't have to actually physically meet, and that is permissible. So um, with two seats being available, the question is, does the board, does the Kirkwood board want to offer any nominations up for one of those two seats or for both of those two seats? And I have not heard back from Mark Louisville PUD or Bear Water, um, if they have any board members that are interested at this time. But I did reach out to their general managers, but they did not reply. And just a clarification, Eric, can the only ones be nominated be members of the board? Yes. Okay, thanks. Well, in general, it seems like a good idea to have representation. So is it more a matter of who wants to step forward? Or if four of you want to step back and leave the one out front, that's the other option. Uh, it's hard to do on Zoom and, and time <laughs> it all properly. Um, it's do, a pretty do low, you have, low commitment so, time-wise. Um, yeah. I, I would say, I mean, they haven't met in 11 years. Um, yeah, they have, to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do have one topic before them, which is ours, which is Peddler Hill. Um, okay. So it is important to us. Yeah. Um, I did okay. attend, and I'll give the details on it in the general manager report, but I did attend the Project 184 meeting today, and EID still does intend to pursue electric service at Silver Lake um, for their dam, which is a requirement of Department of Safety of Dams. Um, they have to have redundant power, and so they are going to pursue that. So this will come again. This issue, will, we will be back before LAFCO again. Um, so it's okay. a, I think it's important for the district for our service area. Um, to, to so I, I think it's important. Um, I, I'd be willing to be nominated, but I don't want to take the opportunity away from somebody else who wants to do it. What's the what's the term duration of this, Eric? Oh, Eleven a, years. Yeah, Eleven term, years. It, um, I believe, yeah. terminate to death. Um, I, I'm going to go off my memory, Doug, and I so don't quote me on this, but I believe it's a two-year term, but it could be a four-year. 
But it would so also I, have to coincide with our own board membership. Yeah, so the so question, you, do, you have, you. do you have to be a board member to be able to, to, to let's say. Yeah, yes, you would have to resign your seat if you were no okay. longer a board member. Voila. Is okay. that what you were asking, Bertrand? Yeah, this is what I was asking. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't uh, have to coincide. I mean, it's you could, you know, it, they could, they do replacements yeah. all the time. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I, I'll be willing to, to give it a try just to, I mean, I'm curious to learn more and stuff. And I think we've got some important things out there. So, you know, Bob, I'll leave it to your discretion if you. And they did meet hybrid that. last time, Doug, because I know that's important to you. They The it last is. meeting was a hybrid. Um, they were in person, but there was one board member on. Okay. Um, Zoom. Is there a quorum requirement for this? In yes, a it's, it's a it's a governmental body. It's just like this board. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, they they did do a hybrid, and I believe they're continuing to do those. So that would be an option for you. Okay. Uh, so Doug has offered his name and nomination. Does anyone else? I'm I'm happy to step back. Okay. So I move to nominate uh, Doug on this uh, last co representation. Okay. And I second it. If elected, what are your what will your priorities be, Doug? You know, this Pether Hill annexation seems like an important <laughs> priority, Bob. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> um, before, uh, just a small addendum. If you wouldn't mind on the resolution on the last whereas, I would prefer that we don't have gendered terms in our resolutions. If we can strike the word him and use either there or a different wording to remove either him or her so that we can have this more general neut gender neutralized so that we do have uh, non-male board members, hopefully at some point, that this resolution would be easily using a different name uh, at some point. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it, yeah, if it had been a woman, I would have put that in, but since we didn't have any, I just cut and paste from Contra yep. Costa. Understood. I'd just rather have more general neutralized terms in general if we can. If that's a problem for anyone, I don't know. No, I suppose that. No, no, I think it's good. Okay, um, not hearing any discussion. Peter, can you do a roll call? Sure, Epstein? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Midrotanda? Aye. Barreau? Aye. Thornburg Aye, it's unanimous. Okay. Doug, would you please send me your resume so I can just attach it to this as well? Sure. And it can be a very one pager if you prefer. Sure. Okay, let's move on to 9F, if there's any update on the USDA ruts. The update is there is no update, which is I'm okay. sure thoroughly shocking for John, um, but uh, I don't see him making the shock face, so he must have expected it. Yes, it's uh, very frustrating, still no letter of conditions, and they keep promising, they keep promising, but unfortunately the state level has no control over the federal level, so we're at their mercy but it is with the federal level now. Okay, so the recommendation then is to authorize the assistant general manager to sign? That'd be a rec recommendation, but I think what would need to be, I, one, I'm presuming, and I, John and I have had this discussion and finances has discussion that the board would like to see the letter of conditions and the terms before we sign it. So I would recommend a special board meeting once we receive them for the board to review them. And at that time, you could authorize the general manager if I'm not here to sign. Okay. But I, I would I would presume you'd want to see him, but if, if that's if I'm wrong, I, I apologize, but I just think it's something important to look at before we before I put my pen to paper without the board having seen it. Yep. Yeah, I agree uh, with that. And then I you know the RUS interest rate is the most attractive we could get. And so we did meet with iBank a few months ago as a potential um, another source of funds, um, but they are a higher interest rate. So it seems like it's good to hold tight with RUS for a little bit longer to see if we can get them over the finish line before we would start taking on the administrative overhead of addressing iBank and which would result in a higher interest rate anyway. And then we have worked to try to keep CoBank um, interested and so far they haven't they've showed interest and they haven't indicated any interest rate increase despite the change in market conditions but that could happen as well in fact i'd kind of expect that would happen if uh, once we get back to the table uh, with a signed uh, loc
Okay, so people should just be ready for a fast moving emergency meeting. Yes. Well, hopefully, if we receive it. hopefully it'll be before the end of the month. So the <laughs> yes, yeah. very much hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And if it's okay. not, uh, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> if not, I hope there's it's a powder day. <laughs> really? <laughs> you think so? <laughs> I think I think we're over for the year. I mean, I was being proud of it. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. we'll see. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, so uh, 9G. Uh, I think we just kind of covered that in there. John did a good recap on yeah. that. Um, they've assured us, you know, at this time, there is no change. Um, I did speak with uh, David Fama from Jones Hall, our bond council, and he said there was no additional action required for us to go to execute the co-bank loan. It was all done under the prior resolutions this board approved. So, and we did have on that one in particular, we did include the assistant general manager as an authorized signatory. So that's already been taken care of. So okay, we're in, we're in a good spot to get that executed. Um, okay, any questions on the financing? Okay, not seeing any, let's move on to uh, 9H, emergency fire funding sources and special tax consultant. Uh, so the temporary advisory committee has been meeting um, or has met and we did have a discussion about, you know, I, I shared with them all the um, prior documentation from the um, similar committee that met in 2018 um, and what, what was looked at at that time. And I think the consensus at that, well, the, the consensus at that time was that a special tax was the um, best option for the district to pursue if we wanted to increase revenue for the fire department. The board declined to per, uh, proceed with that at that time for a variety of reasons. Um, but if we do want to do this, um, we do need to hire a qualified professional to prepare um, the uh, immediate uh, assessment engineer to prepare the report um, and possibly a, a legal counsel as well. The question becomes, do we want to start pursuing that now? Do we want to weave it into next year's fiscal year budget or do we want to do something else or nothing else? And John, Doug, do you? Yeah, I concur with that. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's like a lot of things that you could wade into and say, well, you know, tally up the parking spaces and come up with an assessment based on parking spaces, but it's really just not that simple. Um, you know, cars are parked up and down 88, there's shared parking areas, uh, there's smaller commercial businesses like 7800 Club and things like that. So I think given the complexity there, uh, I agree with Eric, it would be better to bring in uh, uh, someone with that expertise uh, that's an independent party as well um, to prepare that sort of uh, analysis for us. Does this have to go through the 218 process? The special tax is no, it is not a 218 process. It, it, it is a tax, it is a, it is a vote though, um, but it's not a 218. It's, it's slightly different than a 218 process. So it, is, go, it goes on the end owners of undeveloped property? Uh, parcel owners would have a vote. And uh, you've compared that to uh, raising the uh, impact fee that we currently have? Yes. We looked at all those things. Which is a 218 process? Is Which that is a 218, that is a 218 process, yes. That's the negative thing. It seems like it would be simpler in some regards, but uh, it, the 218 process makes it a... You still have to prepare have prepare a, a, rate, a rate study to do, a, to do any 218 process. You still have to have an assessment engineer do that. So you still have to do a study regardless, even just to raise it. You can't just arbitrarily raise it. You have to justify it. Is there any way we could uh, tie this in, into hiring a consultant to look at our uh, connection fees? There are different areas of expertise. They're close, oh. but they're not. It, it okay. would, yeah, they'd be just, slightly different. Just curious. Yeah, it's a good question, but they're slightly different. It's not a rate study, which is where we'd be going with the other one. That's more of a okay. rate study side versus the uh, special assessment engineering, which is a 
kind of a subset of that. So in, in my mind, there's, uh, there's certain things we'd have to pass on to this assessment engineer. And one is what our objectives are. And I would think that one of the objectives is to make sure that for emergency services, that pe people who are in the Valley are paying for it, not just people who own property, that that's one of the problems we're trying to solve. And the second is to come up with an assessment of what's the dollar amount that this or what's the dollar amount and what benefits can we provide at what dollar amounts so there's some way to to judge how much the fee would be is that is that a consensus of what we think we're doing with this yes well, I, I, benefit received bob is, is the way to say it so you know let's take the parking space for benefit out, of our, out of our mouth um, because yeah. that's that's almost a predetermined income and we don't want anyone alleging that. But right. it, the, the amount paid based on benefit received and how you calculate that, could it be parking spaces possibly? I don't know if that's a, that would be up to yeah. someone who's, who's qualified, but it would be based right. on benefit received. So for your, you know, out of valley day skiers, who's receiving the benefit of those? Well, okay, so you now calculate it based on who, you know, who's commercially benefiting from, it's not the residents but they do receive some benefit. Um, the other component right. to this, and, and maybe this is your second point, but the other component of this is uh, it would not be hard because really you just come out with the methodology of, of how you're going to assess it. Um, then you could easily say, well, what if we had a full-time fire department? What if we had a part-time? What if we had a all volunteer? And you could just plug different numbers in um, into that and then uh, approach it that way too. So it does give it a little bit of flexibility as you move forward with the future of the fire department. The other aspect of that is think, yes, we need to think about uh, the, the visitors, but we need also to think about the owner of undeveloped parcel. They also have a benefit of having the valley not going up in smoke. So I think we need to look at that as well. Right. Yeah, that definitely would be in there, Patron, every, every parcel developed or undeveloped would be yeah. part of that. Okay, and different methodologies would allocate, but I think Bertrand's point is that different methodologies would impact the impact to different Correct. parcels versus built and unbuilt. And I think that's an important nuance that we'll have to keep an eye for. That Correct. Whoever would get hired to do this would have to make sure yeah. that they're- I mean, just to, just, to give you a, just to give you a rough idea of one that I was involved in, it was a landscape district and it was Adams Avenue in San Diego. And your set there was a generic assessment to the, the um, neighborhood at large. So whether they were on the street or not, there was a generic benefit to them, e.g. your undeveloped parcels. Then there was how much lineal footage do you have on Adams Avenue? And that was a direct benefit. And then there was an associated cost with that. So um, this is why we need to hire someone who's, this is what they do. This is not the amateur hour. We need to have an expert. Right. And they would definitely consider all that, I guess, is my point, because they've done a million of these and they know which ones go down in flames when legally challenged and they know which ones stand up to scrutiny. So we, re we respond to accidents on the highway. Is that factored in the traffic on the highway? No. Is it, could it possibly be or is, is that just out of the question? <laughs> Yeah, the, the only way to do that is if we want to do a chart, we'd have to, it, it's out of the scope of this. Um, we would okay. have to charge okay. people, but no, not unless they were coming to Kirkwood, then they would have, then they ostensibly would be paying if they were just out on the highway. No. Uh, so I, I think it's a good idea to proceed. And the only thing I would ask, before, you know, before we, or something is, uh, a statement of what we want this person to do and you know just sort of documenting what the conversation we just had sure um i assume the time frame of this was is not going to be done if we started if we found somebody right away it's not going to be done in this fiscal year no i, I, I would be shocked if it were right um, there's a lot of lot of uh, utilities and cities looking for extra funding, um, so their assessment right. engineers are very busy. I'm, you know, I've in my prior capacity, I've worked with dozens of them, and I have reached. I mean, not 
recently, but 2018, 2019, when we were doing this, I had reached out to all, all my contemporaries from back in the day and was just talking. Um, I do have talked to a couple and they are very busy right now. Same with Ray consultants, quite frankly, everyone's very busy right now. So a suggestion would be to start the process to move forward and and the costs are going to be spread across. There might be some in this fiscal year, but most of it would be in the next year, right? Uh, yes, I would think so. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the other okay. question, I guess, for, for the boards, if we're, if we're going to look at starting now, and I'm not presuming the answer, but if that is the answer, um, and we do want to accelerate this, do we want to go through a formal request for proposal process? Um, we're going to get very little interest because we're so small. Um, or do we just want to go with a known commodity, someone who I've dealt with before, or a recommendation from our water, uh, wastewater rate consultant who did all that study? He doesn't do this, but he does work with people in the area. If we want to, if we want to get going on this, then we should probably just pick someone and then have them maybe write a you know, kind of a paper, here's how I'm gonna proceed, here's what I'm gonna consider, and then the board can weigh in on that, like you were saying, Bob. But, or we can go through an RFP process, it's just, it's gonna be very time consuming. Well, well, is there a dollar value that triggers the RFP process? Not for professional services, fortunately. It's only for- Is there, um, any, is there, any, is there any historical, when have we decided to do an RFP process? Because um, this is what, 40 to $60,000, right? For yeah. Yeah, the um, see, we did do an RFP process for the water race water rate consultant. Um, we did the last, I think, the only one we've done since I've been here RFP was for the wastewater treatment plant feasibility study. That was the only one we've done. And was that dollar and was it was the amount in, in the range of 40 to 60 or more? Or? You're, you're there involved. were two contracts on that one, so I'm going to plead amnesia because um, the second contract I know is 140, and I can't remember what the first one was. All right, so it's it's substantially higher than this. Yeah. yeah. But I'm happy to do an RFP process. It'll just, it'll be, you know, when when, when we can get to it. Okay, well, does the advisory committee have a recommendation? Well, we didn't really, we really didn't talk through RFP versus uh, recommendation. Um, if the RFP is uh, not too much administrative overhead, it would, um, it might be a good idea to do. I'd... The RFP process would be weeks worth of my labor interviewing, reviewing. So if we want to set aside other tasks, then then yes, absolutely can do it. But if it's weeks, um, that's pretty expensive for a forty thousand dollar item. Yeah, yeah. Because I have yeah, to, I, mean, I have to build the RFP from scratch. I got to find comparable ones. I you know it's it's not, and then the interviews and then reviewing the fifty page proposals. It's it's not a slam bam. I mean, there's some of it that has to be done no matter what, which is agreeing to the statement of work. Right. right, right. Uh, so we, we really hadn't spent yeah. time in the committee talking about the RFP process, so we don't have okay. any, uh, we don't have any opinion right now. I guess off the okay. off the cuff, I would say for forty thousand dollars to sixty thousand, I'd probably retain a, cons a consultant that is recommended by. Uh, someone we trust and is then interviewed by staff i'd be comfortable with that but um i agree with that other opinions okay. Doug? Uh, it seems to I, be I agree. A, uh, okay i'm sorry bertrand it seems to be a fairly extensive and expensive uh process and and on the other hand we do need to to assess what we are the, the, the issue we are trying to deal with. 
it's just one, uh, but I just don't understand. I just wonder what the ROI on this uh, effort, basically, but that's what I'm worrying, worrying about. Yeah. Uh, on the RFP, you mean, Bertrand? ROI, uh, how, how much are we going to spend and how much are we going to be able to get back through yeah. the process? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, if we want to do an assessment, a special tax, anything, anything like that, we need a qualified rate consultant to do so, um, no matter what. So we need that. Um, okay. the, the second thing is you can build into the assessment or special tax or rates um, so the district can recover those costs in that. Um, over time? Over time, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, not immediately, but yeah, just, yeah. just like we incorporated the rate study for water wastewater into that study it would be a similar process. Yeah, so I, I think that's a critical element here. Otherwise it looks like a lot of effort for not too much. So um, I, I think we need to, uh, so let, let me just ask another question here. Is this, once if you decide to go that road, is that consultant going to look at all possible avenues like tax and parcel and uh, uh, parking fee or whatever. I mean, it, there is no limit on on how to like we try to solve that trouble problem. No, we would we would only yeah. be looking at a special tax. Only the special tax. So that's my yeah. okay. That's my next question in this case. Because there is a, a cost to get something like this going on. I just wonder if we should actually expand it to look at alternative means. You know, the, the, it, it might be not that much more expensive to have actually alternatives. It, I mean, I can tell you they're completely different processes. And um, I mean, I, I can just go off of what the, two, the 2018 recommendation was that this was the best option and the lowest threshold for the highest gain. Um, I, I'd be loath to revisit something we already did to, you know, four years ago and redo it again. Um, okay. But, so, but if that's uh, the pleasure of the board. We... No, no, I, I was not in the loop four years ago. So I, I may have missed some of this discussion earlier, but it has been looked at already. That's what you are telling me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that makes yeah, we've looked at, we've looked at other ways such as, you know, merging our services in with the counties. And, and those are the other options we've looked at. None of them ended up being very attractive. And so now we're really saying we'd like to improve the the capability and quality of the emergency services and what's an equitable way to pay for it. So I think the decision is that we want to we want to be more capable than what we currently have. The, and the, I think, yeah, so the merging thing is not four years ago because I was in the loop at that time. So right, uh, right. Well, that was one of the yeah, examples. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, now that was my concern, but uh, if the, the previous board have already reviewed these issues and agree that the special tax was the best venue here. Uh, again, I'm, what I'm concerned is special tax is like you say on parking or for example, as an example, or on parcel. Is, is it only the special tax on parcel are we going to look at or what? Yeah. The special tax will be based on benefit received. That's the best way to say it. Okay, so it's not exclusive to one kind of benefit. Okay, correct. That answer my question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So that, I'm comfortable. Okay, uh, Peter, any comments? Uh, now, can these funds be used for medical transport? like an ambulance well that way part of the idea of the research is what capability emergency services could we provide at what cost and use those to determine how much money we would need right i mean if we're if we wanted to i mean just to give you a rough idea if we wanted to have a full-time fire department with two full-time employees that's it just two full-time employees um i believe the proposal we received from afpd to give you an idea was 1.6 million annually so that's the, you know, and, and 
that would assume they both be EMTs and that would allow us to have ambulance service again, potentially. But okay. we're talking 1.6 million in, in revenue we'd need to raise. Or what if we went to a part-time paid chief and what would that look like and what the dollars? So it's, once the benefit assessment is completed, you can throw any budget you want at it. So you, the board will have a lot of time, to, a lot of ways to play around with, well, maybe we just want one full-time person or maybe we just want... It, it, whatever the board wants, they can come up with some idea. It's not hard to plug in budgets. Once the, asses the assessment's the hard part, the benefit assessment is the nightmare. The dollars is easy. The budget's easy. Does that make oh. sense, Peter? That answers my question. It's easy to compute, Eric. I don't know if it's easy to pass, but it's easy to compute. No, no, no. I didn't say pass. Sorry. Compute is what I meant. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. I, I, yes. Yeah, to pass yeah. or to pay, actually. Uh <laughs> the, the one thing I would say, too, and, I, and I'll offer this up just uh, anecdotally for, for what it's worth. If the community were to, so let's say we prepare this report and the board tables it and decides we're not going to pursue it. If the community wanted to start um, a drive and get it on the ballot to do a special tax for the fire department, the threshold to pass is 50% plus one vote. If the board proceeds with putting on the ballot, et cetera, it is two thirds plus one vote. Just an anecdotally important thing that is some recent case law that people may find relevant. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, but we can prepare the assessment and if the board decides to mothball and someone takes, the, takes up the mantle, we'd really appreciate it. Hint, hint. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Well, anyway. Uh, all right. So, yeah. No, I'm just happy to do whichever way the board wants to go on this. RFPs, not RFPs, wh whatever. I just I, I, let me know. The consensus I heard is to identify someone through a trusted source that we could okay. use, interview them, and put together a statement of work. Okay. Can I bring that and, and get started? Bob, would you be comfortable if I brought the the potential candidate back to the same committee and, and give them the authority to say yay or nay? That would be fine with me. Is that fine with the rest of the board? Is that okay? What, what, what is the same committee? Oh, the, the temporary advisory committee that has been working on this already. Okay. So that's John and Doug. Yep. Now, I think the and, committee... And I think intimately need to go on the board, I mean, but uh, I'm assuming the committee can move forward, yes. I would bring What I would recommend, I think, Bertrand, yes. and I, I agree with you, I would have the selection process, the scope of work process, all go through the committee and then the board ultimately approve the contract. Uh, no. I agree with that. Not to add more work to John and Doug, but mm -hmm. I'm adding more work to John and Doug. Okay. No worries. Sounds good. Okay. okay. You have what you need to proceed? I do. I, I will get to work on that. Okay. Uh, the last item in section nine then is the biannual customer survey. Uh, so briefly, the two committees have actually been talking about this. So I'm going to, and they're all here, of course. So I'll, I'll summarize. Um, there was a discussion at communications that since the board is going to be looking at master planning and priorities, perhaps it would be best instead of a satisfaction survey to survey customers based on what they believe the priorities are. Um, from the planning perspective, talking about the public benefit charge, um, they wanted to uh, piggyback onto the survey and include questions. If there was a low income program, would you take advantage of it? Uh, and, along with some other questions um, in the uh, same vein. I, I would prefer we don't say take advantage uh, as a it's kind of derogatory. I would say uh, it's common vernacular, Bertrand. I, I, I not gonna applied for words. it. I'm applied sorry. for it. Yes, yes. I, I'm not going to change common vernacular. I apologize, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, then that so that was the um, that was the uh, two to two committees that we're talking about that. So the question is, do we want to do a priority sur based survey or do we want to do a customer satisfaction survey and then the communications committee can start drafting their questions planning can draft theirs and we can weave those together for final board approval 
one thing I'd like to add part of the communication committee uh, was one of the ID would actually to delay for the satisfaction survey because we don't have a full year on the new rate system uh, for electricity. And I think it'd be better to do such a survey once people go through the full cycle of this uh, new system that we have uh, to make sure that people understand uh, all aspects of it. Uh, so I think I've been involved in every one of the customer satisfaction surveys. And one of the benefits is asking the same questions each year. So, so then you know whether you're improving satisfaction or not. And the survey covers a lot of things, not just the electric rates. So I think there's a lot of benefit of, of having those things be repeated each year. And then if there's a few additional questions, uh, I think that that can always that can always be helpful in particular, you know, if we're going to look at some form of uh, low income program, I'd like to know that there was at least one person that was <laughs> would take advantage of would not take I'm sorry, would benefit from it. So adding a question like that, I think is fine. I don't see how the community at large could possibly know what the priorities are for the board because they're not involved on the day-to-day -day processes of what things need to be done, capital budgets, et cetera. So I would be inclined to keep what we're doing so we have year-over-year -year comparisons, add a question or two about some additional things we're looking at doing and seeing if there's a level of interest. Yeah, I agree with that. Being able to look at it from year to year is important. And then also priority based, I think will give you more objective results than if you put particular proposals on there. Just in general, kind of more open ended uh, priority based questions for surveying um, tend to less bias the respondents. So what the community uh, member was thinking, if I can speak for them, uh, was that the survey is fairly long actually. And uh, we thought that having something short, much shorter uh, would actually be more suitable here. We don't want to go as much in detail. And, and we all consider that the customer satisfaction survey, whatever you call that, uh, is still valuable. It's not done every year, it's done every other year. And so this year we would just skip one year. So we make, because of the, of the change in, in the, the radical change uh, in the electrical rate structure. So people had a chance to see a full year before they can comment on it. Well, I mean, and Instead that of seeing, I don't know that nine months versus 12 months is a difference to delay the information for every other utility. I mean, we also made a major change to snow removal. Right. And so I, I just, I just don't see why this, you know, this is the every other year. I just don't see why it's, why the consistency should be deferred. I think one of the problems was that the, the, the satisfaction survey is pretty long. And if we, we were, I think we wanna keep the, the consensus of the communications committee was that we wanted something that was fairly brief and focused on what our customer base felt the district should, should have for priorities was whether it's electric charging station, whether it's firewise, uh, w whether they are even aware of what Firewise is, would they be volunteering for Firewise? Questions like, have you purchased an electric car? Do you plan to? Do you have a, a charging station at your Kirkwood residence that's available? Uh, that, that's kind of what I had in mind. I, I don't, and I, I felt that kind of the, the committee was kind of uh, in agreement, but I could be wrong. No, I agree. That's basically that what was the essence of the meeting. 
Well, I think both types of questionnaires can have value. They're just different questionnaires. I mean, they're not for the same purpose. Absolutely. And the concern was, since our customer satisfaction is already a very long questionnaire, actually, as, uh, I think it's, it is very long. Uh, About 40 pages. Yeah, adding more questions, uh, we are going to lose people through the process, I think. Uh, What's uh, the... Maybe maybe we get should get two different survey and just time them slightly differently. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what what's been the response rate on the long survey? Well, what we what we measure and it, it's in the data is the average time required to complete it, and it was around five minutes, if I remember correctly. We had yeah. a fairly good participation rate. We uh, the two reminders went out. Yeah, what was, I think it was Jess, correct, or Bob, if you remember, participation rate was like 38%, I think. It was around there. I'm looking, yeah. I'm trying to look it up right now. Okay. Um, but it was, Bob, it was, was, Bob yeah. was right. It was about five minutes average for each person to complete the survey. Um, and we didn't get complaints about it being too long because there's a place for comments at the end of it. Um, but I'm looking right now to figure out how many people responded. All right. But another, while you're looking for that, I mean, another way to do it is to say, if our criteria is a five minute average time, then if there's a few, the least valuable questions could just be dropped forever and replaced with some of the other questions you wanna put on. Or we'd probably get more response. If there's a specific survey about your future needs, you know, are you thinking of switching from electropropane or whatever, do you have, uh, having that be a separate survey, I think would, would is more likely to get get more responses. I mean, thirty eight percent is pretty good as a response rate. Yeah, the response, yeah, and that's that's yeah. It's a bit higher than that. It's around forty percent. Yeah, I mean that's that's a good res response rate, and I I prefer in the I don't want to design a. The, the questionnaire here, it's probably not the right place to do it, but I always prefer questions that are more around the lines of what are your future requirements than leading questions like, do you want a, do you want a public car charger? Just because you could get positive responses to the public car charger, but it's the 90th thing on that person's priority list, where if you are more open and say what what future what future services would you like to see? You might get a more accurate response. But again, I, this probably isn't the place to work on the questionnaire. And I uh, I agree, I, with, I agree I, with Bob. Having something consistent allows you to look at trends over time more more easily. Well, I think a good question. Um, yeah, what does what does the customer want us to spend district funding on? I, I see that as a But I think Bob's point, Peter, is to that is, does the average person know that the wastewater treatment plant is failing and needs to be replaced? Does the average person know that we need to drop a new well potentially? Does the average person know that I need to recoat my tanks every year, you know, or at the tune of a couple hundred thousand? They don't know those things. We, we know them because we're enmeshed in them unfortunately. Um, so I don't know what use that has in terms of wants versus we know the needs versus wants, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. We know the actual needs of running a utility. Well, I, I'm not saying that we have to do what the, what the survey says, but I, it, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to be on family feud survey says Peter. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, so just, I just I mean, I, it's like the project that, that we're talking about with the, the heat pumps. Do we want it? The, how does the, how does the community feel about us putting in a heat pump at the CSB or at Lava Rock? And I, 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 I don't expect them to, to know to have an informed opinion. And I think that's why they elected us to look at things and make use our, use our best judgment. Well, I, I mean, we just just last week we got a, a, a an email from Reed Bennett just 
re really asking, is the district gonna do a demonstration project uh, with heat pumps? And it'd be nice to know if the public thinks that's a good way to spend our money or not. But that's, that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go along with what, whatever the board wants to do. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Eric, I see that Sandy uh, has her hand raised. Hi, so I'm on the communication committee and we, we, one of the things we felt was after hearing the amazing priorities that you were um, considering in the last board meeting, we felt like this was really good information to communicate to our Kirkwood community. Um, and what better way to do it than in a survey that they could help you prioritize or at least hear from them what their priorities might be so that it might help you when you're getting ready to prioritize that list and of course people do not understand um, the um, that the waste uh, treatment plant those kind of issues and nor can you explain that on the survey but it, it was really our thought was to not bombard people with surveys and to take a priority list that you were looking at and number one educate the community on look at what your PUD is doing for you these are great ideas and number two if you were going to list these what would be your top three or top five and so that that's where the thinking was but I also understand that it is nice to have um, year after year data that's consistent uh, maybe dropping a few of the questions would be wise since um, maybe they're not pertinent anymore. And possibly we just do the survey of priorities at a later date so that when you're ready for it, the data would be there and gives you more time to prioritize the priorities of what you want feedback from the community on. So that's my two cents. Thank you for hearing. Thank you. So Bob, I think my thought on this at this point is that uh, I don't think we should do two surveys. I think we've, I, I have not had the chance to take the, the survey yet, so I'm excited to take it. But I think we've, it sounds like we've trained our customers to expect an, a survey every couple of years, which I think is great. I don't think we want to add surveys. I don't think that's going to necessarily improve response rate. I think it's important to keep it short. If it's under five minutes, that's fantastic, and we should keep it there. Uh, I do, however, want to make sure that we ask um, some pointed questions, like, you know, my, my report asked for is, you know, if we want to explore a low income program and ask quest a question or two that helps us understand if that should be a priority. Um, I think there could be some pointed questions that are important around prioritization. And if we wanted to have an open ended one that is rank three things, but not having something like wastewater treatment plan on there, because that's just not relevant. It's like three things that we think our customers would have more relevant insight into that could help us make a decision, not not the full gambit of everything that the board is considering. I think that's that's a waste of time and is going to be invaluable. But I think if we could limit it to three questions and maybe remove three, um, that would be my thought at this point and keep it very targeted, but then have some open-endedness that allows, I think to John's point, of some ranked prioritization, but allows us to know if we have any interest in uh, low-income programs or whatever it might be. Um, but that's my thought at this point. Uh, and we mm -hmm. keep it as one survey. Yeah, I, I'd be fine with that. Uh, Peter and Bertrand, does that give you enough information to proceed or? I think so. <laughs> uh, okay. One survey uh, and try to combine the two priorities with uh, customer satisfaction and uh, keep it under 40 pages. Well, or, the number of less. pages is, is not relevant. It's the amount of time it takes to take right. the survey. Right, because you could make it three pages by using a smaller type. And right now it, it's a question per page and they just right okay. here. Yeah. Okay. So, you, so the yeah. uh, consensus is you want the, the committee to come up with a, a draft of questions and then bring them back to the board for comment and, and uh, approval or not approval. Is that correct? I think what I heard was we'll provide you with all the questions from the last survey 
Okay. Find the ones that are the least relevant to us now. I think there could be some playground ones taken off, for example, since we did the new project um, and put some new ones on and planning will come up with their ones relative to the PBC. At least that's what I heard. I see Doug nodding. So maybe I was halfway right at least. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's move on to item 10 then, the general manager's report. Um, just briefly, um, I met with, or I attended the uh, Project 184 um, annual meeting today. Um, for those that don't know, I think I know Peter definitely as well versed in it, but it's um, EID. Um, basically everything around EIDs, water rights in our area. So cables and silver and what they're doing with their, you know, their mitigation measures. It was part of a big lawsuit um, relative to the water rights. Um, so of, of relevance, I think probably the uh, biggest takeaways I got from that was they're still going to want to pursue um, electric service at Silver. They will be retrofitting um, Silver Lake Dam, DSOD, Department of Safety of Dams, has told them their dam needs, I'm sorry, they won't be retrofitting, they will be replacing. Um, it's told them their dam has exceeded its useful life and will need to be replaced, so they will be working on that. Um, over the next few years, it's a very long process to get a dam permitted. Um, trust me, I know, they're not fun. I've only done three and I hope I never have to do another one, but um, they're, they're very long. So they're gonna be working on that. Um, they did talk about the Caldor fire, what it did to their flumes and infrastructure. Um, it was actually really interesting. Not really relevant to us, but you know, since we don't have a lot of above ground facilities like they do, but um, seeing the devastation, what it did to their flumes, um, even their concrete flumes there, um, this is relevant to us. A lot of their um, electrical boxes melted. Um, so something for us to you know, consider with, with what we have. Um, throughout the Out Valley system. So, um, but that was, that was a good meeting, uh, pretty important. Um, they are open to the public. They do advertise them. Um, so if anyone wants to attend, they do them annually. So I can share that next time it comes up. Eric, when you say provide, are they, do they need electric service? So they're going to provide it? I, I didn't They have to, that. yeah. So as I, as I understand from Dan Corcoran, who is their chief operations manager, DSOD requires them to have a backup source of power for their monitoring at the dam. And right now they run it off solar panels uh -huh. and they don't have a backup source of power. I mean, we understand what it's like trying to get to silver sometimes. So they, they need something right. reliable to satisfy the DSOD requirement. Um, apparently they popped on the DSOD radar when they had to replace the dam and now they're telling them they need, they need to meet this requirement, which has been in place all along, but they've, never complied with it so and, but it's going to be a relatively small draw the problem is for them it's still going to be a forty thousand dollar transformer at least because it's a step down so what's the and, and they would want to tap into us they yeah they tap into the out valley line just like caltrans is doing at silver lake at silver lake not at capels no not at, no 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 not at capels okay all right i get it now Okay. No, the, but Project 184 covers cables as well as silver. That's the only reason I okay. mentioned cables. Sorry, sorry for if I introduced confusion there. All right. So if they if they have to replace the dam, how does that affect our our transmission line? We have, we're on the bridge. We're on the bridge, not the dam. Okay. Yeah, so we're, any yeah. impact? We're not. It, we're, we're talking about where the gates are. Um, the you see them opening to the right or to the. I guess that would be the. To the east. Southeast, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we could uh, pick up K's. <laughs> so, so there are still some concern that uh, mishap can happen during construction time. So uh, hopefully that won't happen, but uh, it is a, a project pretty close to our transmission line. They'd have to take out the whole bridge. Oh, okay. So. So it'd be a pretty big mishap. I'm 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 0.01% concerned, but your point is oh, well okay. taken. <laughs> so you are saying the only way we can be impacted is by them destroying the bridge. Correct. Which is it possible? I, I, sure. No, no, no. I I I think I could see a, a crane 
hitting our line. I mean, it, I, yeah. are we? We're like, on the opposite side, thankfully, from where they'll be doing the yeah. work. So that does help a bit too. Yeah, that that helps actually. Okay, good. Uh, anything else on general manager? No, Mr. that was that was probably the only thing of substance. Okay, I assume Brandy's doing the operations report. I don't know. I didn't ask her, and Rick's oh. not here, so. Oh. Um, I thought oh. we were going to skip it, but if I uh, okay, have well, something prepared, I'll let her fire away. All uh, right. Up to you, Brandy. I do not have anything prepared. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, standing committee's report. Uh, um, so, um, finance? Uh, I think we, I think we covered the gamut with, uh, uh, what well, we already discussed, so nothing more to add. Unless Eric, do you think I missed something? No, I think we covered. We definitely covered everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, personnel did has not met since last meeting. Operations. I, I, I uh, lied, John. Here. I lied, John. We did. We updated budget assumptions to include snow removal. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is pretty important. Um, so snow removal is basically flat year to year for overall cost. The revenues flat, but we're accelerating the purchase of this yes. track list yeah right. uh, okay and deferred loan repaid electric right so, so can, can you say a bit more so the so we had a fairly concentrated snow year to not to say low year snow year meaning that we have basically not spend as much for operation in snow removal? Yeah, we're projecting right now about a 60,000 surplus in snow removal. Then we're gonna defer the $50,000 repayment um, to electric for the interfund loan so we can purchase a new trackless machine because um, T1 is dead. Despite spending 20,000 on repairs, it is dead. And we'll see all of that when we discuss the budget. Yes. Okay. So there'll be a chance to review it. Okay. Uh, Peter, operations. Uh, the only thing that uh, we different that we talked about was the Out Valley tree rem removal, and uh, we have purchased a new uh, what they call a side by side, or it's an ATV, but we haven't received the tracks for it yet, have we? Unless that's changed since the last time we spoke. Uh, no, I don't believe we received them yet, Peter. We're hoping to get those while there's still snow on the ground so we can train the operators, and test it out. Uh, but that's all with operations. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Okay, personnel didn't meet since the last time. Uh, communications, Peter? Uh, I think we pretty much uh, covered it. Our, our main discussion was on the, uh, the survey. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, great. And on on planning, uh, Doug, so you discussed the public benefits charge as you wrote up there, and then did you want to ask about the mission statement? If I could have a minute just to bring that up, which was yeah. the, there was a, a, a GM has a, an objective related to having conversations with uh, public officials in the local area. And through that conversation about that goal and objective, which I will say is i think as we think to the next fiscal year whether or not that is a good metric uh, as stated currently and whether it should retain is another is a separate an entity of a question but there was still just a general question that regardless of you know our gm's in, you know, engagement with the public and community members uh, uh just a general question does does eric have the guidance uh need necessary to sufficiently uh represent the board and the district in general and I had pointed to the mission statement as being what I would consider our general guidance of, you know, how Eric would want to represent us from perspectives of sustainability and whatever you might say, or, or prioritizations of, of, of topics. And I had just noted this and I'm asking the board if there is anything that uh, should be further addressed on this topic, or do we believe that there is sufficient guidance provided in the mission statement that um, the GM has, uh, knowledge to go forward with or should there be other should there be an effort put towards to this to make a revision potentially 
Well, I do remember reviewing the mission statement in recent memory, so I can't think of anything that needs to be added. Are there other? And, and just from my perspective, other people the, think to answer the one component, I believe I have sufficient guidance from the mission statement as is. So, from my my perspective, I believe that's enough guidance for me to represent. Okay. Is there any other feedback to Doug? Well, I will, I will take that as meaning that we will not revisit that. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, great. All right, that's this. Uh, and then I think that covers all of them. Uh, so temporary advisory committees, um, anything to report, John? Uh, we went through uh, that with the uh, special tax consultant and stuff uh, discussion. And yeah. I don't think there's anything else to cover. Okay. Uh, the only other thing you might want to mention that is just the process of trying to get a truck in the state truck. budget. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. I thought we were going to be fairly brief on that topic, but um, yeah, yeah. That's that's underway. You can be brief. Okay, that's underway. That's brief. Um, <laughs> and you know, I guess there's no you know no real feedback at this point, right? It's in process. Yes. Okay. Uh, on the electric design strategic planning, you'll see in your packet, we updated the document describing how AMUs are calculated because because uh, there has been the change that we discussed. And um, so that's that's available plus examples to explain how it works. And then the other thing that thanks to Doug, uh, we have pulled uh, the data and they're starting to look at see if there's any correlation between uh, square footage, days of residency, usage, et cetera. And so that we're starting the pro. So Doug's been leading that effort to try to look at some statistical analysis. So we're probably halfway through that. So that's it for there. Uh, the last discussion, opportunity for board members to ask questions for clarification or uh, other items that were not on the agenda. So does any board member have anything they want to add? OK, uh, hearing none, I'd like to then uh, adjourn the meeting. And the next one will be on April 8th at 2 PM. And we'll know on April 1st <laughs> whether well, that's I, in this format or in person. Uh, yes, Fairtrain? Well, I still think if we don't have an emergency extended that we need to look again at this uh, date of the meeting because it could be actually uh, an issue for people to be able to be there in the middle of the week. And, uh, and clearly when we decided that we would start right in the middle of the week, that was not actually considered uh, as a factor. Uh, well, I, I, I just want to clarify, it, it'll be on Friday, and I apologize for the fact that two of us requested the change for this one meeting, and I promise to never ask again. I believe when the board approved this too, we did say we, re we would revisit it in four months, so. I assume that's still the intent and we'll bring it back in at the four yeah. month mark. Do you want to uh, agenda it for four months? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, and I think I already had it in the draft agenda um, for June, which is when it would have been, I think, four months. Or no, I guess it's May. I guess it would be May. Okay, good. Then we'll review it then. Yeah, and clearly the, the, the one of the not hurdle, but uh, things we have to deal with is when we need to make sure that we have at least three board members present at the meeting uh, if we use this average system. And, uh, and middle of the week might be more, more difficult. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, you, I, you keep, yeah. you, all right. So we'll discuss it again, but we're talking yeah. about Fridays, not the middle of the week. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your time. And, uh, well, everybody uh, hug out and I'll C3 start the other meeting. Start the next meeting. Okay, it's thanks. Different, it's a different Zoom link, right, Jess? Yeah, it's a different yep. Zoom link. Okay. Yes, it is. I got to stop this one and start another one. Give me a few few minutes.